For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson, and hello to our friends in the UK. We're glad to see you. Whereas we're not glad to see that apparently that's about it for the Keystone XL pipeline. After 12 long and frustrating years of all maize and no cheese, the company behind the project has thrown in the towel, or whatever shreds of it were left. So, if you're one of those people, including energy industry executives, who still believe cooler heads are bound to prevail on this file, you'd better pay attention. Those people calling for net zero by 2050? Guess what? They really mean it. So investors better pay attention too. In the first quarter of this year, the company behind KXL, as it's known, had already taken a $1.81 billion impairment charge on the suspension of the project, which is quite the sum on something meant to cost $9 billion in total. And worse, the company also had to promise to keep working with regulators, stakeholders, and aboriginals to meet the environmental and regulatory commitments involved in not building the pipeline. Anybody want to step up and try again? We didn't think so. Oh wait, Vladimir Putin does. It's very strange that the backup plan, once we ditch the energy that works, after we try renewables that aren't reliable and have remarkably large environmental costs, including the dirty mining of key minerals, so the plan B- minus is to let governments hostile to our way of life develop fossil fuels and then hold us hostage. Thus, Putin is threatening to cut off natural gas to Ukraine if it resists being dismembered, thanks to the leverage he's getting from the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that American President Joe Biden and German Chancellor Angela Merkel both support. And Putin's threats are pretty crude. At the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum in June, Putin was asked whether Russian state-owned gas giant Gazprom would still ship natural gas through Ukrainian pipelines to the EU once Nord Stream 2 was operational, and he replied, Everything's possible. We're ready for this and we want it. But we need goodwill on the part of our Ukrainian partners. Spend money not in order to maintain the army and aim it at solving the problems of Donbass by force, but in order to improve the economy, work with people. Do you understand? Uh, yes. But then why would our leaders approve such a project, half pipeline and half garrote, when they won't tolerate Canadian crude, or in the case of Germany, develop their own energy supplies, including nuclear? Well, apparently it's the oldest reason in the world, money. Merkel says Nord Stream 2 means cheaper gas for our people. Austrian Chancellor Sebastian Kurz, who spoke at Putin's forum, gloated, quote, Austrian companies are taking part in this, end quote. And Merkel's predecessor as German Chancellor, Gerhard Schroeder, actually works for Gazprom. That's pretty in your face. Meanwhile, President Biden issued a national security waiver so that the main company working on Nord Stream 2 wouldn't be sanctioned, as it otherwise would be in accordance with American law, because of Russia's attacks on Ukraine. Why? He didn't want to annoy Europeans keen to sell out their security, apparently. Whereas Canada can go burn hydrogen or something. Back in 1984, I mean the year not the book, a Soviet dissident named Vladimir Bukovsky declared in disgust that modern liberalism is, quote, best described by the Russian saying that it is like a dog in reverse because it barks at its own folks and wags its tail in front of a stranger, end quote. These are harsh words. But how else do you explain barking at your own fossil fuels while wagging your tail at Xi Jinping's coal plants and Vladimir Putin's natural gas? So, citizens as well as consumers better pay attention to this loopy set of policy positions or attitudes or whatever they are. And I say consumers should pay attention since, for instance, in New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister, just gushed over a report saying her country person should get rid of their dumb cows and cars and gas heating and, uh, and, uh, well, suffer. After calling the climate crisis, quote, life or death, end quote, which at least might represent a rhetorical ceiling unless we're next told that perdition or salvation is at stake, Arden called New Zealand's Climate Change Commission, Heipuarangi, final 400-page report, an achievable blueprint, and, quote, one of the most significant documents I'll receive in my time as Prime Minister, end quote, and also promised to read it at some point. Then she added, in an unguarded moment, that, quote, Having a roadmap doesn't change the fact that the road will be steep and tough at times, end quote. Yeah, especially if, like New Zealand, your emission cuts have been all talk so far. So, in fact, everybody better beware. As the Keystone XL debacle shows, cooler heads 
are not the ones prevailing here. Still, you better not ask questions, because climate change is like bad, man, right? Well, a new study by Swiss Re Institute, which is an arm of the world's largest reinsurance firm, says it's so bad that if we don't mend our carbon sinful ways, world GDP is, quote, set to lose up to 18%, end quote, by 2050. Now, of course, when they say lose, they mean gain. Their claim isn't that the global economy will be 18% smaller in 29 years than it is now. Rather, they speculate that it will be 18% smaller by then than it would be in a hypothetical, quote, no climate change world, end quote. Based on a model powered by, you guessed it, RCP 8.5. But such jiggery-pokery is common because it is much scarier to imply that we'd actually be poorer, even though the idea is nuts. As is the claim that without mitigating action, the temperature would rise by 3.2 degrees, or that we know what would happen in a world where climate did not change, or that any such thing ever existed, or that it could. Still, better pay higher premiums, right? I mean, it's that or go work for Putin. Now, speaking of backward dogs, one of the most embarrassing moments for climate alarmism came when leaked emails from the University of East Anglia's premier climate research unit revealed intellectual partisanship, shabby practices, and outright manipulation of data, culminating in Phil Jones' infamous reference to using, quote, Mike's nature trick, end quote, of mixing different data types, quote, to hide the decline, end quote. But now the British government-run media outlet, the BBC, is doing a documentary about Jones' heroism in the service of a higher truth. Uh, to which we can only retort with Dave Burton of Sea level Info that perhaps they should make it the start of a series whose next installment could celebrate Charles Dawson, perpetrator of the Piltdown Man hoax. And then we add, you know, who knows, Trofim Lysenko? Also, a new study just out in Science Advances provides a novel reconstruction of Southern Hemisphere air pollution from 1750 to the present. There was a lot in the study. What we want to look at now is that the authors, based on 14 boreholes from the Antarctic ice cap and one from the Bolivian Andes, say there were a lot more forest fires over the last two and a half centuries than anyone thought. And this discovery is actually crucial to the global warming debate because those infamous computer models assume that climate is very sensitive to greenhouse gases, but there wasn't much warming in the 20th century because of a supposed increase in aerosols. But if aerosols actually went down instead, then the models are dramatically overestimating the impact of CO2 and its much maligned cousins, and there is no crisis, except in climate science. One big mystery in the settled science of climate change is why the COVID lockdowns didn't affect the increase in atmospheric CO2 supposedly caused by human beings. As Clyde Spencer observes, if humans are a major source of the increase, a dramatic cut in our output of greenhouse gases should have been reflected in the numbers. And if it wasn't, you'd think the guardians of orthodoxy would have something to say by way, if nothing else, of rationalization. Because if rising temperatures drive rising atmospheric CO2, not the other way around, as seems to have been the case historically, their whole theory is in ruins. Now, Spencer also says that the small amount that humans contribute to, quote, total carbon flux into the atmosphere, end quote, that's around 4%, has no impact on how much gets absorbed because, quote, the atmosphere can't tell the difference between anthropogenic sources and natural sources, end quote. This is quite an important point. As he says, quote, it is generally claimed that about half of the anthropogenic CO2 goes into the atmosphere and is totally responsible for the annual increase of about two parts per million annually, end quote. But why? Why would all the natural carbon be absorbed by Mother Nature while half of ours is spat out if she can't taste the difference? And how would she? This is a very important point, as is his additional, almost casual aside that, quote, if it weren't for the economic importance of fossil fuels, we wouldn't have an estimate of their annual production, consumption, and resultant emissions. The available atmospheric CO2 measurements wouldn't allow us to make such estimates, end quote. Hang on, our massive disruption of the ecosystem wouldn't be measurable by looking at the ecosystem? No, because our output is so small compared to natural sources that it has no discernible impact on the increase year on year or even in the seasonal fluctuations in that increase. And Spencer's not done yet. He also says, quote, It is difficult for me to accept that there's an unrestrained, 
positive feedback loop driven by CO2 and resulting in significant surface temperature increase, because if that were the case, one would expect that we would have long ago passed the so-called tipping point and be in a permanent hothouse state like Venus." End quote. Which brings us to another crucial point, also first brought to our attention as an aside. This one's from Richard Lindzen in the Australian Institute for Public Affairs book, Climate Change, The Facts, 2020, about, quote, the general expectation that long-surviving systems are dominated by negative feedbacks, end quote. Negative feedbacks matter because in the world of climate alarmism, all the feedbacks are positive. A small warming from increasing CO2 alters water vapor in ways that further increase temperature, thus releasing more CO2 from the permafrost, the fire ice, or whatever you like, and that further alters water vapor until, in James Hansen's memorably over-the-top warning, the, quote, ocean ends up in the atmosphere, end quote, like Venus. As always, the newsletter has a couple of items from co2science.org, and the first looks at another one of those supposed positive feedback mechanisms, namely the idea that global warming will speed up soil carbon decomposition and cancel out the benefits of more plants due to warming and more CO2 sequestering carbon. But after studying forests in France, some researchers say no. The second co2science.org piece asks whether it's really true that spring is coming sooner. It's France again, southern France, by examining when 17 reptile and amphibian species ended their hibernation. And again, we get some great species names, including Bufo Bufo, Bufo Calamita, Natrix Natrix, and Podarcus moralis, which, yes, means common wall lizard, and etymologically means fast feet on a wall. Who said science and Latin weren't fun? The result of the serious science is a bit mixed. On the whole, it does seem that these reptiles and amphibians are waking up two to three weeks earlier than they did in the early 1980s. But six species didn't change, and of the other 11, some now seem to be in retreat. And since they do seem quite sensitive to temperature, it suggests that the latter isn't climbing relentlessly either. As always, if you find our work helpful, or just like names like Bufo Calamita, please follow us, share our work, and support us so we can continue to pipe up, even if Keystone XL cannot. <laughs>